Hi, everyone. I'm Drew Mitnick, the Program Director for Digital Policy at the Heinrich Boll Foundation in Washington, D.C. Welcome to the third event in our series, America Votes on the Upcoming Election in the U.S. We're very excited to talk to Dr. Gerald West, a leading voice on digital policy in the U.S. He's here to talk about the 2024 elections, uh, what a Harris or Trump victory on November 5th would mean for digital policy. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce Dr. West. He is a senior fellow at the Center for Technology Innovation within the Governance Studies Program at the Brookings Institution. He holds the Douglas Dillon Chair in Governance Studies. Previously, he was the John Hazen White Professor of Political Science and Public Policy and Director of the Taubman Center for Public Policy at Brown University. His current research focuses on media, artificial intelligence, and democracy. He is the winner of the American Political Science Association's Don K. Price Award for Best Book on Technology for Digital Government and the American Political Science Association's Doris Graber Award for Best Book on Political Communications for Crosstalk. His books have been translated into Chinese, Japanese, and Korean, and he has delivered lectures in numerous countries around the world. He holds a PhD from Indiana University. Recently, Dr. West has written about mis- and disinformation during the 2024 elections, including how people can protect themselves from disinformation and why it has been particularly prevalent around recent assassination attempts. He has closely examined the digital policy positions of both the Harris and Trump campaigns. For everyone tuning in, I'll start with some questions before we move to audience questions using the, the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. This event is also translated into German, so if you prefer, please yet use that function to listen auf Deutsch. Dr. West, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. It's nice to be with you, and I appreciate all the interest in digital policy. <laughs> uh, let's jump into the questions here. So the first question is a bit of a, a framing question. Um, both the Harris and Trump tickets have connections to Silicon Valley's, the, the tech industry, in ways that are different from previous election cycles. For example, the wealthy uh, conservative donors are much more visible in this election than in previous elections. What influence do you see Silicon Valley having on the election this year, and how do you see it changing in the future? I mean, you're right. It is interesting. Over the last 20 years, Silicon Valley has been active politically, but more on the liberal and Democratic side. Uh, you know, most of the tech companies are based in California or the state of Washington. They tend to be uh, liberal areas. They have uh, liberal employees. And so historically, more of the campaign contributions went to Democrats. What is interesting about this election year is how some of the conservative billionaires uh, in Silicon Valley actually are now uh, endorsing Donald Trump and openly campaigning on his behalf. Uh, Elon Musk is probably the most prominent example of that. He's also uh, made substantial campaign contributions uh, to former President Trump. Uh, Peter Thiel was very active in promoting the early career of J.D. Vance, uh, Donald Trump's uh, VP uh, nominee. Uh, Thiel hired uh, Vance early in his career, uh, helped uh, launch uh, his career, got him into the venture capital space. So Silicon Valley, I think, is important. Uh, Vice President Harris also uh, still has her supporters in that area, you know, as a former attorney general and senator from uh, California. She uh, knows Silicon Ver uh, Valley very well, has close ties there. Uh, an example of one of her supporters, uh, Lorraine Powell uh, Jobs, the widow of uh, former uh, Apple uh, founder uh, Stephen Jobs, uh, is a very close friend of Harris and a strong supporter of hers. So Silicon Valley, I think, uh, is important in this uh, campaign. And it's interesting that some of the more conservative voices now are more active than what has been true in past elections. And and maybe in part because of the the um, the level of engagement in uh, from the conservative donor class, let's say in in um, Silicon Valley or in the tech industry, um, or as part maybe of a of a resurgence in a, a populist movement on the right. Um, there's a there's maybe we have what we have seen is that um, there's there's more interest in cracking down on big tech and on big tech on both sides or in some form of regulation from both the Democrats and the Republicans. Uh, do you think that do you think that with either a Trump or a Harris victory that we might see some new digital policies in the US? And if so, how do you see those diverging based on on who wins? 
I mean, in general, the political climate about technology in the United States has shifted fairly substantially just over the last two to three years. I would say prior to that, America tended to have a libertarian stance on the tech sector, uh, meaning they basically said, you know, they trusted the private companies to make the decisions. They decided what products uh, to launch and uh, how to uh, uh, sell their products uh, around the world. But in the last few years, public opinion has turned more uh, negative in the sense that people can see some of the clear problems, the privacy problems, uh, the fact that a number of the big uh, platforms uh, have dominant market positions and uh, there are concerns that some of them have abused uh, their monopoly or near monopoly uh, power. So I think there is more interest both from Republicans and Democrats on regulating big tech uh, there are interesting coalitions that are coming together between liberal Democrats and conservative Republicans who feel that these tech platforms just have too much power. They're not always acting responsibly. Uh, they used to do more content moderation. Now some of these sites basically are allowing almost anything uh, to appear uh, on their sites. Uh, and so uh, I think we are in a position where going forward, there is likely to be more regulation of the tech sector we're actually already seeing that at the state level. There are a number of American states that already have passed privacy bills, uh, bills regulating the gig economy. Uh, some have uh, started to pass uh, laws uh, regulating AI. And I think from the standpoint of the tech sector, the thing they worry the most about is if a bunch of states end up passing new laws, their worst case scenario is ending up with 50 different sets of rules based on uh, the 50 states. Like the tech companies don't want to have to develop a different algorithm for California as they do for Texas or Florida. So I think the more active the states become in passing legislation, the more likely that's going to force Congress to take action because the tech companies basically want one standard so that they can take advantage of the scalability of technology. They don't want a bunch of different states having a bunch of different rules that then complicate their algorithms. And speaking of, uh, let's say, regulatory fragmentation on digital policy, um, you know, we have seen, of course, that the EU has has been much more active than the U.S. Um, that's not a surprise. But even more recently, with laws like the Digital Services Act and the AI Act. That address some of the you know some of the more recent risks of digital technology you talked about um you talked about content moderation um in the us i think the most significant federal policy you know you, you mentioned the state level policies but maybe the most significant federal policy on on digital uh on digital policy was the the forced uh ban or sale of TikTok, um which uh you know, I think is unlikely to, it, it doesn't align with kind of the foundation that the EU has has set in the way it approaches digital policy. So do you see either the Harris or Trump administration reacting to or working more closely uh, or in the in kind of the framework that the EU has established on, on digital policy, digital regulation? I think the area where the U.S. under either Harris or Trump would start to come closer to the EU is on antitrust enforcement. I mean, there is a lot of concern in the United States in both parties, as well as among the general public, about anti-competitive practices, uh, the fact that these large tech companies have a dominant market position in a number of different areas. There've been major enforcement actions against several of these uh, companies. So I do think that going forward, there's gonna to continue to be strong antitrust enforcement, regardless of whether Democrats or Republicans uh, win, just because so many people feel that that sector has so much power. There've been abuses uh, in terms of uh, competition policy. There've been uh, anti-competitive practices that have harmed consumers. So I do think uh, there uh, will be an opportunity for uh, the US to move a little closer to the EU on those types of issues. And maybe we can dig a little bit into the antitrust issue too. I think that would be of, of interest. I mean, I think um, you know we have seen a couple a couple cases brought by the Department of Justice against some of the big tech companies. And um, JD Vance, for example, has kind of um, celebrated the the current Federal Trade Commission, even though um, it's it's um, appointed three Democrats and two Republicans. Um, so do you do you see the shape of that antitrust enforcement continuing under a potential Trump administration versus the Harris administration? Do you think 
either either administration would continue that trend or do you see it taking a different shape under under different president? I think there will be interest in anti uh, antitrust enforcement under either administration that there is concern about uh, market abuses uh, that are taking place. Uh, former President Trump, uh, for example, has been very critical of Facebook slash uh, Meta. Uh, and so uh, certainly he uh, seemed to be very active in that area. Uh, Kamala Harris has talked about corporate greed uh, and basically uh, corporations using their power to raise prices and has blamed some of the inflation pressures we've seen over the last couple of years on corporations uh, as opposed to uh, 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 general market uh, conditions. So I do think there uh, will be continuing enforcement in that area. Uh, President Biden uh, appointed very tough enforcement uh, individuals to the Federal Trade Commission, which has been one of the primary agencies uh, where these enforcement actions have taken place. Uh, he also appointed uh, tough individuals to the Department of Justice, uh, which is the part of the government that reviews mergers and acquisitions. Uh, that uh, branch already has uh, forced uh, a few of the mergers that were anticipated uh, not to take place and has basically stopped them, uh, either by outright stopping them or attaching conditions to the merger that the companies uh, didn't want to uh, implement. So I do uh, think uh, there's going to be tougher action in that particular area. Uh, moving to a topic, I think, you know, has been kind of the maybe the area that has gotten the most attention recently, perhaps, but um, AI, it's evolved quite quickly. Uh, and in, to some extent, regulations have uh, followed as well. Um, ChatGPT was released only during the second half of uh, Biden's term. Um, he issued an executive order on AI um, that um, did kind of address some of the some of the risks uh, of AI. Um, of course, we mentioned the the EU's AI Act. Um, do you see Trump or Harris differing in its approach to AI uh, as far as potential regulations that could come out of the next presidency? I mean, I've done probably a dozen briefings on Capitol Hill, both for both with Republicans and Democrats uh, on this uh, very issue. And there is a lot of concern about AI. Uh, I think uh, senators and House members are getting a lot of complaints from their constituents who are worried about how AI is going to change the nature of jobs, uh, change the way people communicate, uh, change the way that uh, services are delivered. There's concern about issues of equity, uh, racial bias, uh, and gender-related uh, biases uh, coming from AI. There are intellectual property concerns. Uh, ChatGBT draws on the property of uh, journalists, uh, academics, and a variety of other uh, people, in many cases, without compensating those individuals for uh, the use of uh, their materials. So I do think there is a potential for uh, legislative action there. Republicans do tend still to be more pro-corporation uh, than uh, Democrats. But even Trump and certainly J.D. Vance has talked a lot about uh, big tech, the problems that they see, of course, they are a little more worried about uh, liberal biases uh, or perceived uh, liberal uh, biases. Uh, but I do think the political climate has changed in such a fundamental way against the big tech companies uh, that there could be a regulation of AI. And again, there are a number of American states that actually have already passed uh, AI uh, bills. Uh, so we are seeing legislative action at the state and local levels. Uh, there are a number of cases uh, winding their way through the American judiciary as well. The Supreme Court has already made uh, rulings in a couple of different cases. So there's a lot that's kind of uh, percolating below the level of uh, Congress. Uh, and I think uh, all those actions are uh, going to encourage members of Congress when they come back in 2025 to think about uh, much more meaningful action than they've taken to this point. And maybe one one thing worth worth mentioning too. You mentioned the state action, um, and and there was a real a bill recently on AI uh, from California that um, addressed maybe some of the forward looking risks, some of the bigger existential risks. Uh, and there was quite a movement uh, from a, a wide group of people to have that that legislation signed by the, the the governor of California. Ultimately, it was not signed, so that legislation is is probably not going to actually go into effect which uh, is an interesting dynamic, especially as I think you, it relates to this possibility of, of federal AI legislation. Um, 
Moving on, I think, to a related topic, you've, you've talked quite a bit about disinformation uh, and elections. Uh, you know, there's been a lot made of the impact that generative AI could have on elections, the, the ease with which it can create and spread deceptive content. Um, it doesn't seem that we have yet seen an election where generative AI has specifically been um, attributed with impacting the outcome. But nonetheless, I think there's still a lot of interest in the topic and it speaks to what could happen in the future. Um, what do you see as the risk in this election or in future elections for uh, to, for disinformation impacting it, in particular, maybe on the, the use of generative AI to impact the election? I think there's a lot of concern in the United States about how AI could distort our current election as well as democratic practices uh, going forward. I mean, uh, because of the recent advances in generative AI, it is now very easy to create fake videos, fake images, have fake robocalls, have calls that sound like they're coming from your grandmother and they sound completely authentic, uh, but they're completely uh, fake. So uh, there's a lot of concern about how those tools might be used in the current election. I mean, almost every day uh, we are seeing examples of this. Uh, there have been fake robocalls. Uh, fake videos that have been put out. I've seen uh, fake pictures of Kamala Harris in a bathing suit hugging convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, that is a hug that never took place, uh, but yet has been widely disseminated on uh, social media platforms. Uh, I actually have a new Brookings Press book out entitled Lies That Kill, A Citizen's Guide to Disinformation that looks at this uh, phenomena and uh, I think people are also uh, very worried about foreign influence campaigns. Uh, we know that Russia, China, and Iran in particular uh, seem to be pretty active on this uh, front. They've been active in other uh, countries as well. So uh, the Department of Justice has already indicted several Russians for uh, foreign influence operations uh, in the context of our current election. So uh, there is a lot of uh, concern about this, and people are trying to understand what is it that we can do to actually get a handle on this plague of disinformation that uh, is uh, appearing in many different countries. And I think one thing you mentioned earlier was that um, the social media companies perhaps are failing to address the challenge of disinformation um, and things like online gender-based violence. The EU now has the Digital Services Act, uh, which we mentioned earlier, that uh, requires the platforms to remove illegal content. They also have a code of practice on disinformation that um, a number of the tech companies, not including X, have signed on to. Um, so there's at least some regulatory structure in the EU. In the US, of course, it's it's quite different. We we perhaps haven't seen anything of that nature. And, and that, I think, gets a little bit just to the difference in, in standards in the US. Do you see any hope of uh, any sort of regulatory response or or a response that maybe that comes out of the tech industry in the U.S. to this to this challenge. I mean, one thing we have been encouraging American policymakers to think about is, in some cases, we actually need new laws so that there is the authority to actually go after the most egregious cases. But there are other examples where uh, we believe prosecutors could use existing laws to go after egregious violations. So for example, we have defamation uh, uh, laws, like you can't knowingly uh, spread false information that creates harm for people. Uh, there was a, a very prominent enforcement action against Alex Jones and in, uh, Infowars that basically were spreading lies saying the Sandy Hook school shooting uh, didn't took place, uh, all of the kids who died, that it didn't really happen. It was kind of a staged uh, situation. There's a major defamation lawsuit, uh, and uh, Alex Jones was found uh, guilty there. Uh, Fox News was found guilty in a major uh, defamation case for uh, spreading uh, falsehoods about uh, voting equipment. Uh, so uh, there are those types of uh, uh, authorities that already are there. It's just uh, prosecutors need to start using them. Uh, there are consumer fraud laws. Uh, there are uh, laws saying you can't incite uh, violence. Uh, the problem is a lot of people don't seem to want to apply these laws to the digital world, uh, even though we actually already apply them to the non-digital space. So we think that there are legal authorities uh, in place uh, and statutes in place uh, that would allow the prosecution of egregious cases. 
It's just a lot of prosecutors are not set up for digital crime. So they need to develop their technical talent. They need to recruit uh, new uh, types of staff who have expertise uh, in these areas. But there's legal authority to kind of go after some of the more egregious examples that we're seeing. And maybe on the um, sort of on the other other side of this, I mean, you, you were talking about um, kind of criminal enforcement against some of the cases, but it also seems like there's a bit of a so social or cultural element too, where, um, you know, people are, are still trying to discern what is real and what is not online. I mean, there's been some talk about the role that media literacy uh, can play or, or other solutions. Do you have any thoughts on kind of uh, the the other the other means of addressing the impact of disinformation on society holistically. I mean, on a longer term basis, I think every country needs to get serious about digital literacy training. All of us need to learn how to think about information in the digital world. It's it's different from like a printed book a world or a printed a newspaper uh, type of situation. False information can be created and disseminated very rapidly. It can scale up to millions of people uh, in a matter of uh, minutes or hours. Uh, so people need to be trained on how to spot disinformation, how to distinguish the real from the fake. Uh, in the United States, we're seeing foreign entities set up fake newspaper sites. Like there's something called the Savannah Times that looks like an American newspaper, but it's completely fake. Uh, that has become a vehicle to spread uh, disinformation. Uh, the Russian channel RT has been very active in uh, promoting uh, false narratives as well. So people just need to uh, learn how to spot the telltale signs of these things. The good news is, in the United States at least, there are a number of uh, both high schools and universities that are getting serious about this, uh, offering uh, digital training uh, programs. But we can't just limit this to young people. Uh, there are adults and especially senior citizens that might be even more vulnerable not having grown up uh, with uh, digital technology. So we need to really educate people, uh, both uh, young people as well as adults, on the nature of this problem. And I think the good news is this campaign has shown so many examples of fake videos and fake pictures. It's actually been a really good teachable moment. I actually think we've made progress as a country. I think people are more attuned to the risks in this area now than they were three or even six months ago. I think that's a nice perspective. I mean, when you have the candidates themselves sharing, you know, AI generated disinformation, for example, it really does bring a lot of attention on the issue. So I think you make a nice point. Perhaps this is a little bit of a, a reckoning where people will see uh, uh, more, more, how they'll have more visibility into, uh, you know, AI generated disinformation in a way that they haven't been before. Um, I'd like to shift now a bit to a, a different topic. Um, one thing that um, the Biden administration would uh, perhaps celebrate as, as one of their uh, bigger accomplishments was uh, making a significant public investment into the production of semiconductors in part to counter the growth of the Chinese chip industry. Do you see a Harris or Trump administration differing in their approach to US high tech manufacturing and the competition with, with other countries? Actually, both Harris and Trump, as well as their respective VP uh, candidates, have been very strongly supportive of strengthening the US domestic manufacturing capability across the board. But I think especially in the technology area and especially in the semiconductor space, just because chips are so important in every sector now, our automotive sector requires a bunch of chips for uh, cars to operate. Uh, chips are important as digital technology moves into education, healthcare, uh, e-commerce, and virtually every other area. Right now, a lot of people don't recognize that uh, most of the computer chips are made either in Taiwan or in South Korea, uh, both places that are very vulnerable. Uh, Taiwan, uh, uh, often under attack uh, from China, uh, South Korea facing a, a, a fortified a border uh, with uh, North uh, Korea. And so the Biden administration has invested over $60 billion just to bring the chip manufacturing capability uh, back to the United States. 
uh, Vice President Harris, if she is elected president, certainly will continue that and will uh, continue to uh, uh, roll out uh, the uh, dollars there. Uh, but Trump also believes in American uh, manufacturing. In fact, sometimes he has often even gone further saying that if American companies want to build a manufacturing capability outside the United States, he's going to go after them. He will find them. He will attack them uh, publicly. He actually did that uh, during his first term. So he certainly will be very vigilant on that front as well. And one suggestion from the Trump campaign, or I think that Trump has said quite a bit himself, and in fact, I think it's a big focus for him, has been this idea of imposing baseline tariffs on products coming from outside the U.S. And I think he has even particularly said uh, higher tariffs on things like chips coming from, from Taiwan. Um, so certainly the tariffs would, would affect European manufacturing. Um, how do you see, how do you see the idea of, of baseline tariffs and targeted tariffs impacting U.S., U.S. relationships with other countries when it comes to digital, digital industries? I mean, Trump has made uh, the adoption of uh, new tariffs uh, for any product coming into the United States, not just from China, but as you point out, uh, European countries, uh, as well as other uh, places. He has made that uh, one of the centerpieces of his campaign, as well as his uh, economic uh, plan. I think most economists and most experts that have looked at this are very unfavorable to that uh, notion. I mean, it's one thing to put tariffs on uh, China uh, and have strong export controls on things that might have national security implications. It's a completely another matter to kind of extend that to every other country, including our European allies. I think uh, uh, most experts view that as a very bad policy idea. Kamala Harris has regularly talked about this as a Trump tax. Uh, uh, Trump seems to think if you put a tariff on that China is going to end up paying and it'll become a source of revenue for the United States, when in reality, uh, when there are tariffs, companies basically pass those costs along to consumers and American consumers end up uh, paying for it. So she calls it a tax on consumers that's going to fuel inflation and uh, create uh, cost of living uh, problems for the uh, average American. But Trump continues to talk about this. Uh, unfortunately, if he becomes president, uh, presidents actually have the unilateral authority to impose tariffs on other countries. Like he does not need congressional action to do this. Uh, so it is something that I, I personally view as a very worrisome uh, development and hope that we do not do that because obviously what happens is if America puts tariffs on every other country, they're going to retaliate and we end up in a protectionist world similar to what the world had 100 years ago. And that was devastating for the global economy at that time. Um, and moving on a bit to um, some of the broader impacts of, of manufacturing of digital technologies or the implementation of AI. We talked quite a bit about AI already. Um, I think as the Green Foundation, one thing that uh, we've, you know, we've been, we've been um, thinking about has been the impact uh, of running AI systems on, on climate, the water usage, the energy usage. Um, but it's also been the case that AI has been touted as a solution uh, able to do research on, on climate. Um, what do you see as the opportunities and harms of using digital technology, um, you know, let's say for the example of, of better understanding climate or the risks that, that digital technologies pose to, pose to climate? Uh, and how do you see Harris and Trump differing on the issue? Uh, AI is a perfect illustration of a what we call a dual use technology, meaning it could the very same technology can be used for good or bad purposes, and it could have good or bad consequences. And I think in the climate area, uh, it, it, there's a clear illustration of this. So as you point out, uh, like the new advances in AI require extraordinary electrical power and water resources. You need water to cool uh, the data centers uh, that are basically supplying the energy uh, that makes uh, generative AI possible. The electrical needs are going to be extraordinary. They're going to be uh, huge uh, increases in the need for electricity as we build out the data centers that will support uh, these uh, AI developments. So uh, that is problematic, I think, for many countries around the world. And I think uh, everybody's trying to figure out 
what are we going to do? Like, how are we going to meet uh, that big increase in electrical demand? And who's going to pay for it? Like, will the tech companies pay for that? Are governments going to be expected to subsidize this? Uh, will consumers have to uh, pick up the tap? But on the other side, there are ways in which AI does enable much better tracking of environmental concerns, tracking of changes in the climate. Uh, satellite imagery is being used to track elephant herds in Africa just to measure the impact of climate change on elephant habitats, on poaching uh, in, uh, in uh, those areas. So uh, AI can help analyze and track that type of information. It gives us better information about how the climate is changing and how it is affecting natural resources, uh, human uh, behavior, uh, and just how uh, the world is adapting. In the United States, as well as in many of the countries, we're just seeing many more extreme weather events. You know, we are now having major flooding in North Carolina uh, from the hurricane uh, that just went through. Other countries are alternating between floods and drought. Uh, we're seeing ty typhoons, uh, hurricanes, and just large scale storms because the planet is getting warmer. Uh, the atmosphere is getting warmer. There's more water retention that takes place. And then when storms come through, they're just dumping a huge amount of water on places that haven't seen that kind of rainfall in 100 years or sometimes in 500 years. So uh, AI is, is problematic as well as potentially helpful in thinking about all these complicated issues of climate change. And it, I think it's a very relevant time to be having that conversation. We just saw it in the the Appalachia region of U.S. Um, Hurricane Helene did quite a bit of damage, and, and entire towns and cities were were underwater uh, within the past week, and and the devastation is is quite significant. So I think it's 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 fair to point that out. Um, I I do want to remind the audience that they can put uh, questions into the Q and A system, um, which we'll be we'll be getting. Um, to here shortly. I think one thing that might be of interest too, I, uh, I've heard it come up a few times recently, um, has been around cryptocurrency. I mean, you talked about the sustainability challenges of AI. Um, I think we've seen um, President Trump um, back cryptocurrency. I mean, he's personally has engaged with his own, with his own, with his own currencies. Um, and it seems like taking a, a more laissez-faire approach to cryptocurrency. How do you see the? How do you see each of the the potential presidencies uh, approaching the issue of cryptocurrency? It's interesting. Trump a year ago was actually very negative on cryptocurrency, and then as more of his fundraising started to come in in the form of crypto. He then flipped over and now seems to be a fairly strong proponent of uh, cryptocurrency. So the crypto industry sees him as an ally in this regard. The Biden-Harris administration has been interesting in the sense that Biden appointed pretty tough-minded people to the Securities and Exchange Commission, and they have taken a very tough and negative stance on cryptocurrency uh, and basically uh, demanded greater transparency, uh, uh, putting guardrails in place to make sure that crypto does not become a vehicle for consumer fraud, uh, illegal uh, cash transfers, uh, supporting human trafficking, uh, supporting money laundering, and other uh, illegal activities. So uh, the Biden administration was very tough-minded uh, in trying to uh, regulate uh, crypto. Harris has basically... Uh, taken a more moderate stance of that. Uh, I think we are now anticipating she will not be as negative on crypto as some of the Biden administration appointments have been. I don't think she's as fully embracing of crypto as former President Trump is right now. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, all the candidates are seeing there's a lot of crypto money coming into campaign finance uh, this year. And as you know, American elections are unduly influenced by uh, money. And this is just another example of, you know, the crypto industry is putting a lot of money uh, into uh, the candidates in terms of helping to finance their campaigns. And the result has been the candidates have shifted 
uh, in a more favorable uh, direction. So I think the jury is out on how tough a possible Harris administration would be on the crypto sector. That's a that's a, a good point. I think it, it, uh, it's it's hard for these campaigns to resist the that big source of funding. It seems like there's been a lot of new infrastructure built around specifically supporting campaigns when it comes to the, the cryptocurrency differences between the candidates. And I think that's that's maybe uh, a, a newly uh, it, you know the, the significance of that that funding has has grown within the past within the past few years. And this this uh, election cycle has been one of the one of the ones where it's most visible. Um, so we're going to shift a little bit to the questions that we've started receiving from the audience. I think uh, it looks like one question is uh, uh, specifically about privacy. Um, the EU has the GDPR, which has been in effect now for 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 a while. I think it's been six years. Um, there has been some privacy legislation that has been introduced uh, in Congress. It seemed like maybe this past uh, this, this, the past year, there was a lot of excitement over, over some legislation on, on, on privacy. And then there's also been attempts to address, um, uh, risk to, to kids and teens online. Do you see any chance of, uh, a, a federal private general federal privacy law under either a Harris or, or Trump administration? The United States is long overdue for national privacy legislation. I mean, we have been uh, pushing for uh, that for a number of years. There have been times where it has seemed like we're pretty close because they're both Republican and Democratic leaders who understand uh, the importance of this. If you look at public opinion surveys, consumers complain about the loss of privacy in the digital world almost at the top of their complaints about the tech sector. So there's a lot of public interest in uh, legislating in this area. But somehow Congress has not managed to uh, actually get its act together. I do think uh, there will be concern uh, either uh, with a Trump or a Harris administration on continuing to push uh, in this uh, area. Uh, and in the case of congressional inaction, we are seeing American states uh, take action. California has passed a major uh, privacy bill. Virginia has done so. Uh, there are a number of other American states that either have done so or are about to do so. So I think, you know, between the EU regulations, uh, which affect American companies, uh, of course, which are operating not just in the United States, but in Europe. So the EU privacy standards almost have become a de facto global standard, even for countries that haven't adopted their own privacy legislation. So between the EU net, which is kind of uh, forcing a lot of uh, global corporations to respect uh, the, the rules that have been put in place in Europe, and the fact that a number of American states have moved into this area, we are edging towards uh, national privacy uh, laws. But you know, it's high time for Congress to step up and just pass the bill. Uh, like <laughs> consumers want it, you know, we all see uh, examples of privacy invasions uh, that are taking place. Uh, people uh, don't like that. Uh, they want uh, action. Uh, so I, I do think we will get that in the near future. It's been a long time coming. Um, we have a couple more follow-up questions. Um, it looks like the first one is about um, the the topic of crypto and AI that we discussed a bit. I mean, I think um, you know we have seen, for example, new commitments to energy infrastructure in the U.S. to respond to the demands of AI. So, I, uh, Microsoft, for example, announced that they're going to be trying to draw power from um, some nuclear power plants that um, have been inactive into the up until this point. So. The question is about the infrastructure investments required to support the the growth of the AI industry. Yeah, uh, that's a really important uh, question, and it's a question that is unresolved right now in the United States. I think people do understand that all these new data centers and all the new AI applications are going to require a lot more uh, energy, uh, electrical uh, power than uh, what we have right now, I don't think anybody really knows the answer how we're going to get that, uh, and certainly how we're going to get it like right away, like in the next uh, one or two years, which is when we're going to need it. That Microsoft example, I think, was very interesting because, you know, of course, we had this catastrophe at Three Mile Island a number of uh, decades ago and closed down the nuclear power uh, plants associated with that. 
Uh, the proposal now is to reopen uh, some of uh, those nuclear power uh, sites in order to uh, provide uh, the electrical power that is needed for these uh, AI applications. Uh, the idea is if you actually need the increase in electrical power right away, you know, we can't wait three, four, or five years for uh, new power plants to come online. So they're starting to look at uh, these uh, places that have been uh, snowballed uh, and try to figure out ways to uh, bring them uh, back online. So uh, but I think we we don't really have a clear national strategy on how to address that issue, but it's a very pressing issue and we need to figure out how to handle that. And one more question we have from the audience. Uh, we talked about the ways to address uh, disinformation. And the question is specifically about the individual user when they're kind of approaching uh, social media. Do you have any any tips, uh, concrete tips on the ways that people can engage with the information they see online and figure out what, what is disinformation and what's not? I mean, people just need to understand there's a flood of disinformation that's online, not just in the elections area, but in public health, in climate change, in race relations, and in virtually uh, every other area. I mean, even with the flooding that we've seen this week in North Carolina, there's been disinformation there about Biden never calling the governors of those states when he actually uh, did. So it, it's just something that whenever anything happens, there's disinformation that kind of uh, floods uh, the scene uh, there. So people just, uh, one, need to be vigilant about information sources. They need to understand that a lot of information they're seeing probably is not true. Uh, they should be careful about sharing uh, information uh, with other people. And this is where the highly polarized and hyperpartisan nature of American politics today is highly problematic because people want to think bad things about political adversaries. And so when they see something negative about the opposition online, everybody's impulse is to spread that information, even in cases where they know it's false. I mean, there have been public opinion surveys where we've asked uh, Americans, have you spread information that you knew is false and like 30 or 35 or 40 percent of americans say yeah i've done that uh and and that's shocking uh, so this is not a case where americans are being duped about spreading disinformation like they're intentionally doing it because they want the other side to look bad so uh there are a lot of problems uh, in our uh, book uh, the citizen's guide to disinformation we present a number of things that people can look at when they're evaluating information uh, sources, uh, they need to look at the track record of uh, that website. Is it a new uh, website that has just uh, popped up? Uh, is there any uh, uh, foreign link uh, on that website? Uh, people should definitely be suspicious of uh, some of the sites that are popping up that are being supported by uh, Russia, Iran, uh, China, and other uh, places. So there's just a lot of ways in which consumers need to be skeptical in a digital world. And um, I, I know you've you've written uh, quite a bit about these topics, so I, I would certainly encourage everyone to go to Dr. Daryl West's page on the Brookings Institution. And, and you mentioned a couple of the books that you've read, you've written recently as well. So uh, we're going to we're going to wrap things up here. Um, before we close, we'd just like to thank everyone for taking the time to join us today. Our next event will be on October 16th at 6 p.m. Central European time. Foreign and Security Policy Program Director Teresa Eder will be interviewing Professor Paul Post on what we can expect, expect from a Harris or Trump presidency on foreign policy and the relationship of the U.S. to Europe. Dr. Darrell West, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much.